We've been looking at the visions of heaven that are presented for us in the Bible, each one seemingly more spectacular and more confusing than the one before. And it brings us to Ezekiel chapter 1 today. And I want to look at Ezekiel chapter 1, and, and I'm going to do something I never, ever do. In fact, I try very hard to avoid doing it. Uh, I'm just going to read through the entire text. Uh, it's a much longer reading than I normally engage in, but I, I don't know any other way to communicate what's going on with this. And I'll, I'll set you up a little bit with regard to what to expect, etc. Ezekiel is a prophet in the land of the exiles in Babylonia. The uh, Israelites have been taken captive. The northern tribes, of course, had been deported many, many decades before and uh, scattered to the four winds. And now Judah itself is starting to crumble. And 10,000 of the best and brightest were taken into captivity in Babylonia, in the region near Babylon. And Ezekiel's with them and testifying to the people that God has not abandoned his people, but that God is punishing his people because of their evil. And he has plans, of course, to bring them back. But he begins his prophecy by emphasizing who God is, basically, and we get this extended passage uh, emphasizing the, well, it, it's, it's wild and crazy, basically, what we're looking at. We're looking at a, a very disorganized and very chaotic kind of picture. It really reminds me very much of the book of Revelation, where it's not nearly so much a, a narrative, this happened and then this happened and then something else happened. It's just a, a series of images and visuals and just bombarding the senses, especially, uh, essentially. Revelation, of course, is extending over uh, many, many chapters. And, and so does the book of Ezekiel also. But primarily, we're just going to look here at the actual picture of God. The picture of God sets up the message from God that we get in chapter 2 and 3. We're not going to get into that. But uh, I do want to emphasize what we see here in the, uh, in the picture of God and God's glory in Ezekiel chapter 1. And ordinarily, I'm a very, very big three-point outline kind of guy. I don't know how you go about writing a three-point outline for what we see here in Ezekiel. Again, it's, it's very disorganized, very chaotic. And so we're just going to kind of hit some highlights and look at some of the images that we see and what it makes me think about, at least, and maybe inspire you to read Ezekiel and read these prophecies and come up with your own conclusions with regard to such things. Uh, the images have deep background in the Bible. I think we're going to see that as we go and give an idea of what God is trying to communicate, and especially in the context of the exile as God is punishing his nation. This should be seen in that context. Anyway, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came directly to the prophet Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kibar Canal. The Lord's hand was on him there. I looked, and there was a whirlwind coming from the north, a huge cloud with fire flashing back and forth and brilliant light all around it. In the center of the fire, there was a gleam like amber. The likeness of four living creatures came from it, and this was their appearance. They looked something like a human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the hooves of a calf, sparkling like the gleam of polished bronze. They had human hands under their wings on their four sides. All four of them had faces and wings. Their wings were touching. The creatures did not turn as they moved. Each one went straight ahead. Their faces looked something like the face of a human. And each of the four had a face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left, and the face of an eagle. That's what their faces were like. Their wings were spread upward. Each had two wings touching that of another and two wings covering its body. Each creature went straight ahead wherever the spirit wanted to go. They went without, touching, without turning as they moved. The likeness of the living creatures was like the appearance of blazing coals of fire or like torches. 
Fire was moving back and forth between the living creatures. It was bright with lightning coming out of it. The creatures were darting back and forth like flashes of lightning. When I looked at the living creatures, there was one wheel on the ground beside each of the four-faced creatures. The appearance of the wheels and their craftsmanship was like the gleam of barrel, and all four had the same likeness. Their appearance and craftsmanship their appearance and craftsmanship was like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions without turning as they moved. Their rims were tall and awe-inspiring. Each of their four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels moved beside them. And when the creatures rose from the earth, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, the creatures went in the direction the spirit was moving. The wheels rose alongside them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, the wheels moved. When the creatures stopped, the wheels stopped. And when the creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose alongside them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the head of the living creatures, the likeness of an expanse was spread out. It gleamed like awe-inspiring crystal, and under the expanse their wings extended one toward another. They each also had two wings covering their bodies. When they moved, I heard the sound of their wings like a roar of a huge torrent, like the voice of the Almighty and a sound of tumult like the noise of an army. When they stopped, they lowered their wings. A voice came from above the expanse over their heads, and when they stopped, they lowered their wings. Something like a throne with an appearance of lapis lazuli was above the expanse over their heads. On the throne high above was someone who looked like a human. From what seemed to be the face up, the waist up, I saw a gleam like amber with what looked like fire enclosing it all around. From what, I, what seemed to be his waist down, I also saw what looked like fire. There was a brilliant light all around him. The appearance of the brilliant light all around was like a rainbow in a cloud on a, on a rainy day. This was the appearance of the likeness of the Lord's glory. When I saw it, I fell face down and heard a voice speaking. And then the message comes in chapter 2 and 3. I don't doubt that if I had been there on that particular day, I'd have passed out too. I would have collapsed from the sheer awe of what I saw. And I don't doubt for a second that words fail Ezekiel, even Holy, Holy Spirit inspired words fail to properly communicate what's going on. I think that's just the nature of, of human communication in general. They, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and uh, this picture required, I'm sure, a lot more than a thousand words. Anyway, I don't think the point of this text is to show us what heaven looks like any more than any of the other depictions of heavenly glory are intended to show what heaven looks like. I think it's supposed to give us an insight into what heavenly realms are like from a spiritual perspective. And the images that we see there are intended to communicate spiritual truths for us. And so I'm going to put my hand to this a little bit and uh, feel free to come to different conclusions if you like. But uh, when we are interpreting passages of, of prophetic importance and, and uh, spiritual significance, we need to make sure that we don't drift too far from the Bible pattern as a whole. There are certain passages of the Bible that are really pretty straightforward. And the spectacular passages like this or the book of Revelation, etc., are not going to tell us something that the Bible isn't telling us. So it should be seen in the context of the things that make some more sense. And the images that we have here in Ezekiel or Revelation or whatever other passage you might want to talk about, these images are intended, I believe, to draw our attention to certain stories, certain events, etc. And that's what we're going to be doing a little bit here today. And again, it, it's difficult to dissect this passage and, and uh, take it apart verse by verse. So what I'm going to do is just kind of look at, at four basic pictures that we have here that are attached to the glory of God and maybe examine a little bit why they are attached to the glory of God, what that might mean in the history of Israel and what they might mean for us, what they meant for Ezekiel back in that day. It begins with a whirlwind, a tornado or a cyclone, whatever you want to call it. This, this incredible windstorm that may immediately call to memory the story of the Exodus. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, the power of God was seen 
in a form very much like this. Exactly how much like it's difficult to say, but the text says in Exodus chapter 13 that the presence of God was seen in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And your guess is as good as mine as to exactly what that means. It sounds kind of like a, a dust devil, as it were, was, was following them around and it, and it assumed some kind of light at night, however it might do that, and there was more cloudy during the day. Was it a, a, a natural phenomenon? Those kind of things do happen. Was God just controlling that phenomenon from day to day and hour to hour? I don't know. There's, there's no way of knowing. The important thing, of course, is that they were given assurance of the presence of God in this moment, which is kind of an interesting thing when you think about it. A cyclone, a tornado, is an extraordinarily destructive thing, and usually you want to be as far away from that kind of thing as possible. And certainly there is a sense of terror that we get here in Ezekiel. God is going to war. In fact, Jim McGuigan in his commentary likes to describe this this event here is a picture of God's war wagon. God is, is going to war against humanity, and we'll have more to say about how he goes about doing that as we go. But the idea of seeing his, his presence in this terrifying image of a whirlwind ought to give us the idea of how powerful our God is and how he is channeling that power for our benefit, for our blessing. The Israelites should not have been terrified of the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire back in those days. It was a comfort to them, or should have been at least. I don't doubt the first time they saw it, they were terrified, but they came to realize that it was signifying God's presence among his people. And in fact, in one occasion, it literally blocked the path of their enemies, so the enemies could not approach them in their vulnerable state. That power of a whirlwind indicates how strong this God is and how capable of destruction, whether it's destruction of his people or destruction of the enemies of his people, how powerful he is. There is a very interesting parallel passage, you might say, in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, and maybe some of you already know where I'm going with regard to this. The prophet Elijah, one of the great figures of Old Testament history, was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot and a whirlwind the text says that in that context, which may be the first thing you think of when you think of a chariot, in, especially in prophetic terms, as we see here in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, a prophet also, he sees God coming in a chariot. Well, there's a no doubt familiar with the story of how one of the greatest prophets, in fact, arguably the one who represents all of the prophets, especially the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah was taken up to heaven in this whirlwind, this chariot image, which is clearly very different from what Ezekiel saw, still has to bring this to memory. Elisha, the successor of Elijah, says in chapter 2, verse number 11, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, which appears to be kind of a, an expression indicating how powerful this whirlwind was, that the presence of God coming to take Elijah to heaven, uh, essentially, how incredible a vision this must have been. And exactly why we get this same exact phrase in chapter 13, verse 13, in a very different context, well, somewhat different context. Uh, it's difficult to say. The king of Israel sees that Elisha, the same Elisha, is, is about to die, and he says, my father, my father, the chariots, of, uh, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, just like Elisha said back in the day. Is this an indication that Elisha told his story to everybody who he saw? I, if I were in Elisha's position, position, that's what I would do. Everybody in town would have heard about this story. It would be difficult to imagine how I could possibly not tell this story. Maybe that's what's going on here. And maybe the king is indicating that the passing of Elijah in, was very similar to the passage of Elisha, although maybe not quite as spectacular. Still, the idea of God's prophet being taken from the people was a, a remarkable kind of thing. And not necessarily in time for celebration, a time for celebrating the power of God and, and the willingness of God to communicate through these great men of the past. But it's certainly a, an opportunity for mourning when they're taken from us, however it happens to be that they're taken from us. Anyway, we could speculate all day on that, but, but clearly the point being that when God communicates with mankind, 
whether by giving us a prophet or by taking one away. This is a, a statement of power, that chariots and horsemen of God. God is going to war against evil at all times. And you hope and you pray that when we say evil, he's talking about other people. That's, that's the way that it should be. But we also realize that even in our most righteous state, even in the best we ever can possibly do, we're still sinful souls. And still, ultimately, God's war against sin is going to touch us. And so, maybe this is part of why Ezekiel collapses. Maybe it reminds us a little bit of Isaiah's story in Isaiah chapter 6. As he sees the glory of God, and he also is moved to fall on his face, and he repents of his own sin. No matter how righteous Ezekiel was, no matter how righteous you and I may be, the appearance of God coming to war against evil touches us directly and should be, move us immediately to bow and to lay prostrate before our God and beg for forgiveness, beg for mercy, because no matter how much we may look down our nose at other sinners who may, by some very self-serving standard, may seem to be worse sinners than we are, ultimately, we are all on the receiving end of God's wrath, and all of us need to be begging for mercy, because the, the power that God shows in the whirlwind is overwhelming, and we know that we are subject to him, that he could wipe us out at any time. Now, thankfully, he loves us and he is merciful toward us. And if we have faith in him, like the Israelites did in, in times past, like Elijah and Elisha did, like Ezekiel did, the faith that we show in these moments is, is reckoned to us for righteousness, just like it was for Abraham in times past. People of faith have access to the throne of God, have access to the mercy of of God that's available through Jesus Christ. Now, I don't doubt Ezekiel didn't understand that in its fullest, but we do. We understand that we are delivered from the impact of our sins, the guilt of our sins, because God has come to earth to wage war against sin and wage war against the devil, and we are the happy beneficiaries of the grace that results from that. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the living creatures. And most of the Bibles that I've read, most of the translations that I've read have words similar to this. Yours may have angels or something along those lines. What is a living creature? I don't know. How Are they supposed to be the same as the living creatures that we see in Revelation? I don't know. There are some obvious similarities between these two. They are different to a certain degree. Is this one species of angel here and there's another species of angel in Revelation? I doubt that very seriously. I think that all of these depictions of God's creation, God's creatures, those ones who wait before him in heavenly realms, are again given to us for, for spiritual impact rather than some kind of clue to us when we go up in heaven we see one of these particular things. Oh, that's what Ezekiel saw because it looks exactly like Ezekiel chapter 1. I don't think that's the point. I think when we see one of these living creatures, we'll, we'll recognize and we'll know what we're looking at at that time. At any rate, whatever these creatures are, call them angels or, or whatever, the point is that these beings are connected to God in a, a very impactful and personal way. And whether you call them cherubim or seraphim or whatever the text may sp uh, specifically indicate, what we have repeatedly is a connection to worship, a connection to the holiness of God and ministering before the throne of God because of his greatness, because of his holiness, these uh, living creatures in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, are, are also along the same lines, extolling the holiness and the righteousness and the goodness of God. I, I don't know what an hour-to-hour -hour experience in heavenly realms is like, even if they have hours in heavenly realms. Again, the main point is to indicate to us what happens in spiritual realms, and, and I don't have time or inclination to get into a big discussion about the parallels that occur between heavenly realms and physical realms and the overlap between the two and what happens when the two connect and, and the bridges of the gap at, that we see every once in a while, that sort of thing that's way, way beyond our scope here. But clearly, at least there is this, that there is worship in heavenly realms when worship is taking place in earthly realms, the glory that is given to God in human flesh, people like Ezekiel, like you and I, when we come before God in worship, this is a reflection of what is happening in spiritual realms. And the worship that we engage in 
whether it's on a Sunday morning or you you singing along with hymns in your car or your personal prayer life, whatever it happens to be, your connection, your fellowship, your participation in spiritual activity is a connection to heavenly realms. And I wish I could tell you, I wish I knew personally exactly what that meant. But at the very least, it ought to at least inspire us to know that we are taking place in a a level of spiritual activity that's not just getting together with a lot of nice people and singing a lot of nice songs and, and praying nice prayers and things like that. As wonderful as that is, as wonderful as it is for us to read our Bibles and to pray and to sing, to con- commune with the Lord at his table, these kind of things, these are reflections of spiritual realities that are going on. And the idea, perhaps, of worship taking place at this kind of level with this kind of creature should inform us to exactly how powerful worship is and how proper worship is. And if these amazing creatures can devote themselves fully to worship of the Heavenly Father, then surely you and I are not exempt. That we should also, like Ezekiel was, be driven to our knees to bow before our God as we see whatever depiction it happens to be, however picturesque it may be, knowing even just looking at a starry sky at night like David does in Psalm 8, just basking in the presence of our God should be enough to realize that we have an opportunity to connect with heavenly realities, our spiritual side, as it were, when we worship. And why you would want to wait around till one particular hour on one particular day of the week to do that, if you manage to get out of bed in time to do that, why you'd want to do that, I don't know. This is a, a lifestyle that we should engage in. I don't think that worship only takes place in heavenly realms on the Lord's Day. And I don't see any reason to think that at all. This seems to be a continuous sort of thing. And surely our lives should be spent in continuous worship before our Heavenly Father. Now, I want to talk about the wheels because the the wheels are kind of at the at the center, if you will, of, of this story, the wheel within a wheel kind of thing. This imagery is seen uh, a lot in, in hymns, in uh, songs uh, that have, have graced the people of God for, for centuries at this point. What exactly does this mean? What are these wheels? Why do they have all these eyes? We can go on and on and on about this, but at least it means this, that God's chariot, God's war wagon, again, is mobile. And it doesn't require a three-point turn, as it were. You know, if, if I'm, I was in a parking lot today, and you pull into a parking space very carefully, and when it's time to get out, you have to back out, and then you change directions, and the wheel turns and turns and turns, and you, wherever you turn the wheel, that's where your car goes. Well, God's chariot doesn't work that way. God's chariot just goes. The, the wheels that, that direct the car turn themselves, it would seem. Now, what exactly does that mean? I don't know. I, I think at least it means this, that God is not requiring to back up and turn around and, and get his bearings and, and look at the compass points, et cetera, et cetera. God where it goes where he wants to go. And uh, his mobility, I think, is at the core of this. Uh, I think similar images are given to us in Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I stand up and when I sit down. When I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You're aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. Going through verse number six there. And you know we use words like omnipresence to describe God that is very similar to uh, the uh, pantheistic kind of notion of God, that God is in everything, that God's in the rocks and God's in the mountains and God's in the rivers, etc. And and biblical omnipresence is not that. I, we're not supposed to understand that God is physically present in any physical form. He shows himself in some spiritual forms in a literal sense. We talked about the the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud before, and the burning bush, and and various other images that we get in the text. Certainly there are ways that he showed himself in what appears to be even a tangible form. 
that did happen from time to time. And you could speak metaphorically that, that we can see the power of God or the, the, uh, the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God in the human body itself and, and the various inner workings of, of the universe or the atomic structure or whatever. This is a vision of God also. I'm not going to quibble with that. I think that's an entirely appropriate point. But God himself is not in a particular place or in every particular place. God is in heaven. God dwells in spiritual realms. When we talk about the omnipresence of God, what we mean by that is God is relevant everywhere, that God's power is seen everywhere, that God's force, God's ability, God's oversight is seen everywhere. And that's what Psalm 139, I think, is talking about here. Every aspect of humanity, every aspect of the physical creation has to do with God. There is no place where we can go to flee from God's presence. Jonah seemed to have thought that he could do that. Remember getting in the boat and going to Tarshish appears that he thinks he can escape God's jurisdiction somehow or another. That's, that's been my reading of that for, for years and years. Why a prophet of God would think that, I don't know. Maybe he was just uninformed. Maybe he was thinking about something else. But certainly there have been people over the years who have thought that God's rules didn't apply in certain situations, that you know, it's perfectly fine to obey the, the rules that God has when we're in the church house or whatever, but when I'm out in the world, I'm doing my own thing. That, that's me time. Uh, I make my own rules there. That's, that's for me, and then Sundays I'm going to do God's things. No, that's not the way it works. God is everywhere. No matter where we may go, we're going to find God there. We're going to find God's rules there. We're going to find God's presence there, his power there. Just like the rules of gravity work everywhere. The rules of thermodynamics work everywhere. We don't escape those things. That's part and parcel of the physical world that we are living in here. Well, where did those rules come from, if not from God? God's the one who set all these things up in the first place. And the, the rules that he has established for us, not just the physical rules, but especially the spiritual rules, all of these things apply to us at all times. We're not going to be able to claim, well, you know, I, I get my Fridays off, I get to do whatever I want on Friday. No, that's not the way it works, not unless God gives you Friday off, and he didn't. So what we need to do is recognize how mobile God is, that he goes into every hour of every day of our lives, every circumstance, every relationship, every turn of of affairs that may come across our path. God has to do with all of these things. And it takes no effort for him to get there. Again, the wheel within a wheel. God operates as he wishes to operate. You're not going to be able to be one of these guys behind the wheel of the high-speed police chases. He makes a quick turn, and the police have trouble adjusting and getting around, and he caught them unawares, and they're going to have to reconnoiter, and they're going to get on the radio and call somebody else to get on. No, that's not the way it works. God is on you at all times, and we need to, uh, to recognize that and appreciate that and really glory in that. I think that's the point of Psalm 139, not to make us afraid that we're not going to be able to get away from God and he's going to hold us accountable. He's going to beat us up because we're doing bad things and we can't ever get away from him. Now, I don't think that's the point of Psalm 139 at all. Psalm 139 is celebrating the fact that God is with us at all times, that every aspect of our life has to do with God. That's a wonderful thing, something to absolutely celebrate. And one other point before we, we close up, I want to talk about this idea of an expanse or a firmament. Different versions are going to have different words here exactly. Uh, the idea of the firmament goes back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 7, of course. This is part of the creation. And I don't doubt that there was a physical barrier back in those days, in the early days of creation, a, a physical barrier that nothing penetrated except light. That there was very much a sense of almost like Earth is a terrarium or something. It's a very enclosed system. There's all this stuff in here and the, all this stuff out there. And, and light could penetrate it. You have the sun, the moon, the stars, etc. But for the most part, we're just enclosed within this, this firmament, as it were. And a, a separation of what is in here versus what is out there uh, naturally gives the impression that this is, is where men are and the rest is where God is. And the firmament therefore separates uh, us from God. I don't doubt that that is a, a very big picture of what's going on. I think that's what Psalm 144 is talking about, where God is going to bow his heavens. It's not bow your heavens, by the way. It's bow your heavens. Uh, that God is going to 
bow his heavens and come down and touch the earth. God doesn't do that in that sense ordinarily. Ordinarily, we think about God being in heaven. We're down here on earth and we are subject to him. But the very fact that he is held apart from us, that he is separated from us in heavenly realms, should impress upon us the, the spiritual nature of his being. And I'm sure that's part of what the firmament or the, or the idea of heaven is to emphasize to us. Not just that God's on another planet out there living, you know, kind of similarly to we, what we do here on this planet. No, God is completely different from us. God's dwelling is completely different from us. There is a separation that we cannot break, that we cannot separate, that we cannot uh, pass through, as it were. But there are times that God does pass through it. God does bow his heavens and come down and touch the earth. Now, there's a sense, of course, in which God is always touching the earth. There's a sense in which God, just like the sunlight penetrating through the clouds down to, to earth, God is touching us at all times, that everything on earth is a reflection of his power and glory and providence. And, and we acknowledge that and we celebrate that. That's absolutely true. But there is also a sense in which God you might say breaks the rules where God changes things and directly intervenes in the lives of human beings or in the world in general. We see this with Solomon and Gomorrah. We see this with the, the flood of Noah's day and, and on and on we could go. And, and what you might call lesser activities as well. The general answering of prayer, the idea that God is disconnected somehow in some ongoing kind of way that God is is separated from human affairs. No, that's not the case. That's why the psalmist prays that God bow his heavens and come down and touch the earth. There's a specific circumstance, a, spe a specific set of circumstances where God wants to involve himself. And we are praying that he involves himself, whether it's coming in and touching our enemies or touching us with blessing, with grace, whatever it happens to be. The idea of God being removed from us in heavenly glory, apart from us, on the other side of the firmament, that emphasizes how wonderful it is, how majestic it is, that he is able and willing to occasionally come down and touch the earth. Now, when he does that, you would be well advised to be on the right side of his grace because God coming down and and touching the earth in Psalm 144 and other passages as well, things do not go very well for the people that have prompted his coming. Usually it's a, a horror story, a, an awful, awful thing, and God has forborne for a time at least, but now he is coming. He's coming to judge. He's coming to condemn. He's coming to punish. And that should be a blessing for us as the people of God, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're the ones on the receiving end of God's wrath, and to a certain degree, Ezekiel is also. Far be it from us to say that, that we are righteous enough to be on the other side of the firmament, as it were. We're part of the, the glorious state, and God's coming down to touch all these, these bad people. No, he's coming down to touch all of us. He's coming down to condemn all of us. And thankfully, because we have a Savior, because we have chosen to live our lives in trusting and obedient faith. The wrath that God shows in Psalm 144 that's, that's called, uh, or the people are calling for God to show it uh, in Psalm 144 and many, many other passages as well. We know that we are saved from that wrath because this, this ancient penalty, the soul that sins shall die, that doesn't apply to us anymore because Jesus has died on the cross to preserve us. And when we see God coming in wrath against his enemies, we know that we are not the enemies of God. Not because of our, our great righteousness, but because we have contacted God through his son, Jesus Christ, in obedient faith. We have put him on in baptism. We have connected ourselves to spiritual realms. And when God comes in warfare against his enemies, that's not us anymore. That we have been delivered from that. We are safe in the arms of Jesus, as the old Fanny Crosby song tells us. We are comforted in this state. Now, we should certainly take warning, as Ezekiel does here. We should take caution, realizing that we are not preserved because of our own righteousness. We are urged to holiness and righteousness and confession of our faults. 
But when we find that we are on the right side of God's wrath, we need to do what Ezekiel does, going through ver- chapters 2 and 3, and really through the rest of the book also. We need to go out there and do the work that God is asking us to do. It may be that he has come down and touched the earth in this particular situation so he can grab you, so he can motivate you to go and do his things in a particular particular area. Now, I don't know how much specific, how specific a plan he may have for you, but at least he has this, that you can, as a child of God, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature with your words, with your behavior, with your value system. You can be salt in the earth and light in the world, like Ezekiel was, like Isaiah was, like so many of these great worthies were of the Old Testament. You can and you should and you must first be on the right side of God's wrath, and then secondly, urge other people to be on the right side of God's wrath too. That's why God reveals himself to us. That's why we need to reveal God to others as well. I hope and pray that this is a blessing to you, that you can be awed at the presence of God and come into compliance with his will in your life so that you can be a light in the community, that you may be a light in the world, and that God's glorious chariot may one of these days come and take you to heavenly glory as well. Thank you very much, and God bless.